At this time, our third through fifth grade can be dismissed, and I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. As you're turning to your Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 5, I wanted to just highlight a couple things that have been going on the last few weeks, say some thank yous. We just came out of our week of sports camp, and we had so many volunteers support it that it would be impossible to thank them all, uh, but you do know who you are, and I just want to say uh, I'm very proud of the work that we were able to do serving uh, over 100 kids this past week with a great night uh, on Friday night, finishing out with their families, uh, being able to share the gospel clearly with those families that came and begin to just continue to connect with them and minister to them in the days ahead. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was probably 30 or 40 different volunteers through the week that, that gave their evenings to make that happen. And so I want to say thank you uh, to you for that. And uh, I'm just excited about how uh, God will continue to use that. I want to encourage you to pray for those families that we ministered to, that God would give us an ongoing ministry to many of them. Uh, the other thing that I, that I wanted to mention, you know, we just had a team return from Iceland last week. Uh, we had our high schoolers and Chris and Amy McCraney uh, led that team and they were in Iceland last, uh, they got back last Friday and they ran a STEM camp for families there in Reykjavik that the church had invited. It was really great. Sunday Sunday evening, uh, Gunnar, the pastor of Lofstoven, uh, the church that we partnered to plant several years ago, um, he messaged me that evening and he said, make sure the team knows that four of the families that came to STEM camp that had never been to the church before came to church on Sunday and told us they're excited to continue to come back. So that was a really great, great job from our team. And it's awesome to see uh, just how the Lord worked through their effort there. And so praising God for, for that as we go out and strengthen church plants and are a part of the greater mission beyond just what God is doing here in this church. With that being said, let's read 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, down through verse 11. Here's what Peter writes. This is God's word. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we ask for your blessing on the reading and study of your word, Lord, as we consider it this morning. We ask that you would open wide our hearts, that you would prepare us to hear what you want to speak to us personally. God, I just pray, God, that you would grant us insight by your spirit into the circumstances of our lives, into the upcoming events that we might face, and Lord, that you would strengthen us for times of suffering and trial. God, we trust in you to do all that you've promised. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been in the middle of this series this summer uh, called Greatest Hits, where we've been looking at the most popular 10 verses in the Bible and asking what they really mean when we study them in the context of their passages. And so today, the, the verse really comes out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 7, where it says, Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Uh, these are the kind of verses that get, you know, put on uh, T-shirts. They get printed on coffee mugs. 
They get uh, sent in greeting cards. And, and this one has a particular context that I think is, is really important. All of us desire uh, to be able to rest our cares in the Lord. But here it's in a passage that I think gives us some really powerful insight that we can uh, anticipate this morning. So let's look at it together. Uh, you know, I love to travel whenever I get the opportunity. There, there's just something to me about discovering uh, a, a new place and getting to know uh, that new place and kind of digging into it that really excites me. It's especially fun, you know, when you can get to know a place, you know, beyond the tourist traps. You know, if you go into a place, many times there's like the obvious things that everybody says you have to do, but, but there's something cool about discovering stuff that goes beyond that that is uh, really powerful. Sometimes, you know, we need some insider knowledge when we're traveling, not just to get beyond the tourist traps, but to protect us as well. And it reminded me, uh, you know, that that kind of insider knowledge of a culture, of a place, of a situation, sometimes it, it can be kind of hard-earned insider knowledge. We went to Costa Rica last year as a family, and uh, during the prep for that trip, we decided we were going to rent a car, and we got a family of six, and, you know, renting a, a six-plus uh, passenger vehicle uh, is is a little more challenging and a bit more expensive, and we were trying to figure that all out, especially when we were uh, going to be there. We were on sabbatical and had an extended amount of weeks and lots of luggage, and I like to travel heavy rather than light. Uh, and so when we arrived, um, it was late. We get to the car rental, and, and it's time to pay the agent and the agent informed me that I also had to pay for a mandatory car coverage that essentially doubled the cost of the rental car. Now, I mean, it's like 12.30 in the morning. You know, we're falling apart from traveling. And, uh, you know, spread out over the parking lot of this little Avis rental place. And I'm looking at this person. I was like, first of all, this is a scam. No way. And, uh, you know, and I show, start showing off my paperwork. You know, and they look at it. I've already paid for everything. It says paid in full right here. And they're like, oh, yeah, but it's not talking about the mandatory everywhere additional insurance that the whole country requires. And I'm like, I talked to my insurance agent already. Anywhere I go in the world, my insurance transfers to my replacement car. I've got it right here. It's all covered. I even brought, like, the, the document that said so. And they're like, no, that doesn't matter. This is a countrywide mandatory additional insurance. You're not getting the car if you don't pay for it. And so I did the only reasonable thing. I paid for it. And, uh, you know, that, that was a bit of a painful experience and a rough landing and some insider knowledge. So recently, uh, somebody, I can't even really remember who it was, was, told me they were going to Costa Rica. And they were excited to take their family. And I said, listen, I, you know, there's a lot of things I could recommend that you do. It's almost impossible to not have a great time in Costa Rica. But the one thing that could ruin your trip, especially the landing, is if you don't know that when you rent this, if you rent a car, it's going to be about double whatever it says on the website. And, you know, that I, I just felt like, you know, I want to save you the trouble. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I want to I want to get you past this experience and save you some pain. I don't know if they were listening. I hope they were. But if they weren't, they'll have a great story to tell to someone else. Ultimately, this passage here is a set of instructions about traveling the road of suffering and trials. I think it's important that we recognize that Peter is the author. I think it's important that we recognize that Peter went through his own dark moments of suffering and trial, and he's writing to us as an insider. He actually wants to give us sort of an inside track on what it's like to experience suffering and trials in the world. And, if, and this is sort of an insider's guide to how to prepare ourselves, not just to survive, but to be able to thrive in those moments of trial with a sense of hope in the Lord. And popularly, Peter, in his insightful, Holy Spirit-inspired words, giving, giving tune to those, we can face our trials trials in our moments of suffering with a sense of mature insight. 
And so we're going to see, in, in particular, that this, this passage is so full of insight. You, you know, I had to really narrow it down. I try to keep myself to, to three or four points. And I, this is the sort of sermon where the passage is so impactful and it's been so personally helpful to me in moments of trials and suffering that it could have been a series of sermons. So I've narrowed it down to three particular insights around Paul's three main verbs that he gives us in this passage, or the three main instructions, and we're going to just follow Paul's structure, and we are going to listen for what Paul gives to us as an insider's insight for making our way through suffering and trials. The first one is this. The first mature insight is is that facing trials successfully requires us to humble ourselves. Facing trials successfully requires us to humble ourselves. Let, let's look at it in the text itself uh, first. You know, when we get into the passage right away, we, we see that already in verse 6, it says, humble yourselves. It's, a, you know, both in English here and in the Greek, it's set in the prime position of the sentence, this instruction, so that it would feel like the, the sort of emphatic thing. What's going on? He's instructing us that the most important insight we need for enduring times of trials and suffering is that we walk into it with a sense of humility rather than pride. That, that we humble ourselves before God. And, and so the key driver of this entire instruction is built on this first command to face our suffering with a sense of humility toward God. Of course, verse 6, which I just pointed out, is built on the premise of the previous verses. You know, we really could have backed up and, and began reading in verse 1. We would have gotten into lots of other topics, but, but it's really tied because, because you see as we get into verse 6, it says, humble yourselves, therefore. And that therefore is pointing back to something. It's pointing back in verse 5, if you have your Bible out and are looking, uh, where he says he's instructing those in the congregation who are younger to particularly be subject to the elders of the church. And, and here he means in times of, of suffering and di- difficulty to put themselves solidly under the leadership and guidance of more mature leaders who have been put into place in the church. And, and he tells them in doing that, that they're going to have to clothe themselves, all of them with humility. And it's built on one premise. It's built on a core theological truth about God that all of us need to be convinced of, that God opposes the proud, he says, and he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. I think there are are not many more clear things about God's relationship to people in the scriptures than this statement that he opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is a core theological truth about how God relates to people. And, and so he, he gives this instruction off of the foundation about who God is when he then says, so humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, the powerful hand of God. So in this image, he's using, in this instruction, he uses several images that are to bring it to life. The image in the broader passages that were to, in verses 1 through 5, all of us to clothe ourselves with humility. And that's meant to represent an entire, entire covering of our life with humility that is visible in the way we do it. So that we don't just say, oh no, trust me, inside I'm humble. But that we would actually structurally go through the real motions of humility. That might look like a command to make some sense of it. Here's the story of what God does through our trials. Notice he doesn't just say, humble yourselves, you're going to have to go through this. He says, humble yourselves, let me give you some insight into how God uses suffering. So he goes on in verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now there's... There's a story to that. It's not just an instruction, but it's a, it's a narrative about how God uses suffering. He continues this imagery when he says, 
humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He's, he's showing us, what is, it, what is this going to look like? Well, it means recognizing that there is a powerful shaping season in our lives that goes on from the hand of God when we go through periods of trials and suffering. The, the, the idea of God's hand in this particular instance is meant to strike up imagery of the potter and the clay. You know, there's this Old Testament passage where, you know, uh, where the idea is that the, the clay shouldn't say back to the potter, what are you doing? But instead, allow the potter to, to shape it the way it needs to be shaped. You know, the, the hand imagery here is supposed to bring to the mind this shaping hand of a potter in our most difficult circumstances. Listen, suffering and trials, they transform us in ways that we would never otherwise change when we humble ourselves under God's purpose, purposeful hands. You know, it's, it's a really strange thing that in God's design and economy, some of the things that we most want transformed about ourselves, we really won't participate in until God puts us under the shaping work of suffering and trials. You know, the way it is, is, is this. As long as it's tolerable, I'm just going to keep being me. I'll stay right here where I'm at. There's nothing that needs to change. I'll just keep explaining it, Amanda. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> as long as it's tolerable, I'm just going to keep being me. You know, and if we're, if we're humble and we're willing to admit it, there are a lot of things that need to change about me. And I can say that, my wife can say that, my kids can say that. There are things that have needed to be transformed and shaped and changed in me. And I've found that in the most difficult seasons of my life have been the times where God has shaped the most important character elements for the next season. Because as long as everything is okay and in the status quo, I'm probably not going to work to make changes. But, but when I begin to realize that, that I don't have control of as much as I think I had control of, I begin to f- try to figure out what, what's gotta, something's got to give, right? The tension gets too high. And, and there's a decision for us at those moments of suffering and trials about what we are going to do. Are we going to flee from our connection with God and seeing this in relation to God? Or are we going to humble ourselves under his hand and say, Lord, shape me however you want for the future? Because there are just ways in which we are transformed. Suffering and trials transform us in ways that we would never otherwise change when we humble ourselves under God's purposeful hand. And part of the humility of this that we experience practically is to entrust the timing of what God is doing to him. You notice how he goes on, and he, and he finishes the story for us. He says, you know, do you know that in those suffering and in that trial, God is often doing his shaping work like a potter to the clay. He's bringing out things in you that would have never been there, and, and it's not just so that you can grow and not just so that you can become mature, but because he has a way in which he wants to promote you in his purposes in the future, and he's not going to do it until you're ready to walk in it. And so what, what happens here is we believe we can get microwaved into God's purposes for us when he has to leave us sit and settle under his shaping work for the thing that he's yet planning to do in us. And he says that in the right time, in time, God exalts his people. He promotes them to what he wants them to do. And so, listen, this is an incredible purposeful story. And some of you who might be going through difficult suffering and trials right now, You need to ask yourself, do I see myself inside this kind of narrative or have I just believed that what I'm going through doesn't have a purpose? Because what God does through suffering and trials is he shapes us for the things he wants to promote us to do. For times of exaltation, he says. He shapes us for exaltation. You you know, Many times we want to hurry through that, and God is still working on us. So, so Peter says part of the humility is, is to say, God, 
in this season, however long it takes for you to get me where you want me, to do in me what you want to bring out of me, I'm willing. There's a sense of surrender that's needed, of consecration. It's a, it's a holy moment in our lives to entrust to him. Well, Peter knows and understands this well because Peter had a major failure in the midst of suffering. He can look back and see it really clearly. Humility under suffering precedes exaltation to our future assignment. Three simple stories in Scripture underscore this overall story, I think, that we've just been lining out. First, there's Joseph. Think about Joseph in the the book of Genesis. Joseph had to practice humility by remaining faithful to God when he was sold into slavery by his brothers. When he was falsely imprisoned after that, while serving in Potiphar's house, he had to be faithful to God while he waited in prison, and the cupbearer forgot him, even though he helped the cupbearer know what was coming. Pharaoh's cupbearer comes down, Joseph interprets his dreams, and and, uh, he says, remember me, and he's forgotten yet again, and he has to be patient. He's got to be humble. He's got to wait on God's time. And in due time, he has to be humble enough to forgive his brothers to accomplish the purpose that God had of saving Israel from famine so that he could keep his promise to deliver the Messiah through Abraham's line. And Joseph would be exalted. All of that suffering was so that Joseph would be ready for the moment when he was promoted. Daniel had to humble himself as a young man as his nation was overcome by the Babylonians. He was carried off as a refugee and put into the king's service and trained. And he decided to be faithful to the Lord and wait on the Lord. In due time, Daniel would be exalted. He not only endured the trial, but became one of the most influential figures in the government of two succeeding empires. What's amazing is not only does Daniel advance to being an advisor to King Nebuchadnezzar, but when King Nebuchadnezzar is conquered and and the next empire comes through, they keep Daniel. They bring him along because he seems to be the kind of person that stands out from everyone else. Well, that's because he was devoted to the Lord and he humbled himself under trial and God exalted him. Jesus is ultimately the one pictured by all of this and who we are to see as the prime example of God's work through suffering. He humbled himself by moving from the glory of heaven in eternity past The divine son took on flesh, Philippians chapter 2. He was despised. He was rejected by humanity. Even as he genuinely cared for them, came as their savior, taught us, healed. Not only was he rejected, but he was crucified on the cross like a common criminal. But what did it look like from his vantage point? He humbled himself. He gave himself up, he says, on the cross. They couldn't take his life. He offered it. And so this is the same tension that that is going on here. The circumstances are overcoming him. Evil is being done against him from outside of him. But at the same time, he is giving himself to the process of walking through what God has called him to. What the Father has sent him for. And he puts his future in the Father's hands with his last words on the cross. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And on the third day he rose from the grave, exalted and victorious over death. His victory was not only won for him, but he stands as the entryway of faith for all of us into God's saving purposes in his kingdom. And if today you will cast yourself on him by faith and humble yourself before God, not looking to yourself for salvation, but confessing you're a sinner, believing in his victory on the cross, you can be exalted to share in his blessing. His suffering with humility preceded exaltation and God's blessing for all of us. There's this willingness of us to look at what we're experiencing and and remind ourselves we're not up to the task apart from the Lord. You see, part of casting our cares on the Lord is being convinced deeply that there isn't really an option to keep them ourselves. 
Some of us most struggle with going back and forth between sort of resting something in the Lord's hands and taking on the full burden of it ourselves because we're still pretty convinced with just a little more effort we can handle what we're facing. But see, as an outworking of humility here, what he's saying is these things are, uh, 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 these things are too weighty for us. We, we exercise humility by fully recognizing that God is the only one who can see us through suffering and trials to their good purpose. That, that our future is actually dependent on Him. And, and the many things that we can't control, the many things that are way beyond our abilities, are firmly in His hands to figure out and not our own. And we have to learn to actually do this in our hearts, to go there with the things that, were, that are burdening us. We, we imagine ourselves just under his shaping hand, and we put those cares, and we, we name them. We, we say, God, this is the thing that I'm not sure about. I, I can't handle this. I can't resolve this. I don't know what to do about this. And we begin to put it over there and say, Lord, these must belong to you. I'm going to, I'm going to be faithful as I wait on you to resolve that thing. And through that, we come to discover the deep abiding care of God. I think what he means here in casting our cares on him is rather simple. We understand it. Trials bring us right into the face of our vulnerability and weakness. We're shown beyond a shadow of a doubt in our suffering that we cannot control our circumstances. And to be truthful, this could set off all sorts of concerns about the future that can overwhelm us. And those concerns are legitimate. And I don't even have to name them for you. Some of you have them now. But what Peter wants to do is he wants to transfer your trust from yourself to a God who cares for you. And he wants whatever suffering and trial that you might be walking through right now to be a time where you really discover that deep abiding care. As you begin to name the things that are bringing fear to your life, the concerns, what's going to happen, and you begin to entrust those to God, and you see ways in which God begins to resolve them in his own purposes, use them for things that are good. And you begin to discover that God cares for you personally. And deeply. He wants to transfer our trust. Listen, when we're succeeding in life, we believe life depends mostly on us. And when we're suffering, we hope to God that it doesn't. We begin to, to look and, and ask for him to come and minister to us. To meet our needs. Well, here's some good news. This is written by Peter, and I think it's just so powerful to think about this. Peter was a failure under his first major trial, and through it, he discovered the care of God. I mean, maybe you're here today, and you're like, you know, I've been through some periods of trial and suffering, and I realized my faith really wasn't that strong. I pulled away from the Lord. I did things that I wished I hadn't done to cope with the fear. And you may look at that and go, man, is there any good news for me? Because I, I, don't, I haven't been steadfast under trial. I've failed. I've fallen short. Well, Peter, Peter is writing this because what he wants you to know is that God cares for you. When Jesus was arrested, Peter had been warned by Christ. He said, Satan has asked for you that, I might, that he might sift you out. That he might just pull you out of following me. And he warns Peter, and Peter says, if you remember what Peter does, Jesus warns Peter uh, about this, and Peter says, never, Lord, no, not me. There's nothing that could happen out there that would make me deny you. You know, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You see the contrast. And the Gospels show us this picture of Peter and his pride. He, you know, he's arguing with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is trying to create sober-mindedness, and he's arguing with him. And so Peter, you know, the, Jesus is arrested, and Peter's the one who doesn't really understand what's going on, and he's the first one to pull the sword and do what Jesus isn't planning to do. <laughs> And when he puts that, when Jesus tells him to put the sword away, Peter is in this moment of intense suffering. His, his friend is arrested, and he's not going to get the future that he wanted. 
He, the thing that he thought Jesus was going to do isn't happening. And he finds, he finds himself around a fire with Jesus on trial. And, and, and he denies that he even knows Jesus three times. And, and the last time we're told is a, it's a young girl that he's afraid to admit that he has an association with Jesus before this girl. So in this moment of suffering and trial and test, Peter fails. We kind of get the indicator the night before that he's headed for that because in the garden when Jesus says, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation, Peter and the other disciples, they fall asleep. And Jesus comes back and he kind of exhorts them and rebukes them. And he goes back and Jesus is praying because he knows what's coming. And so we get the sense that Jesus needed to be plugged into the strength of God in the, in the work of the Holy Spirit in this moment. And Peter doesn't know he needs it. And he's not alert. He's not vigilant. And, and so Peter fails. And Jesus is crucified, and Peter is, is gone. And he actually goes back to fishing where Jesus called and said, leave your nets behind. And we find Peter and the other disciples fishing with Peter kind of in the lead. And what happens? After Jesus is risen from the dead, he goes and he finds Peter. And he says, come on, Peter, I want to talk to you. And here's what I'd like you to see. Sometimes part of our trial is our failure. Part of our suffering in life is coming face to face with our weakness. And, and, and so this trial and this moment of suffering is going on for Peter. It's not over yet because he's got to look at Jesus and answer three questions. For three times he denied. Do you love me? Of course, he answers, of course, Lord, I love you. And he asks him again. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. And he asks him again, do you love me? And you, get, you hear this third time, this sort of sorrowful exasperation in Peter. Yes, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And, and Jesus recommissions him in that moment and sends him back into what he had lost when he had fallen in the trial. And, you know, we see a whole different Peter from that day forward. A Peter who is ready to suffer in Jerusalem, who's used powerfully by God, who becomes what Jesus said he would become when he said, on this rock I will build my church. And it only happened as he gained humility under trial. And so I think the reason Peter's talking like this to us is because he wants you to know that level of care from God. Whether you've been successful and you're struggling in the midst of a trial and you're wondering, does God love me and care for me? He's like, he's, he, no, he does. And, and even further, if you've failed and you've fallen short, that you still have at the throne of grace because of what Jesus has accomplished for you in, in paying for your sins, you still have grace and mercy from God to be expected if you will draw near today. If you will draw near today in your trial, in your suffering, in your failure to the Lord, you will find grace and mercy in the time of need and because we can cast all of our cares, all of our weakness, all of our failures, all of our anxieties on him and know that God cares for us. And when it says God cares, it's not just a feeling, an emotional disposition, which is important. God has a warmth towards you. He has an emotional draw and love for you that has been given to us because we are under the blood of Christ and fully forgiven. There's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. So God doesn't look at us upon our record. He looks at us through Jesus Christ, faithful obedience and he's drawn to us with warmth and love even in our weakness under trial and suffering right now. And so you can trust him not just for how he looks at you, but what he is intending for your future. His purposes for our future are good and will ultimately be realized as we entrust ourselves to him. And Peter wants you to know that because Peter knew it deeply. Lastly, he shows us this. If we are going to be successful during times of suffering and trials, we're going to need to be sober-minded and alert, he says. 
sober-minded and alert. We're going to stop really digging into this passage here in verse 8. There's more we could look at in verse 9 and 10 and 11. But look at the next instruction. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. It wasn't just, you know, here we really just have one command, but that Peter needed kind of two words to help us see it. It wasn't enough just to say, be sober-minded, because that's, like, that's a sense of clear-headedness. In times of trial and suffering, we need some way to become clear-headed about what God's doing. We need to take it serious. We need to look at it with a sense of clarity, but then he adds to that, be watchful, be on alert, because there's, there's a bit of an urgency to it. That, that sober-mindedness in and of itself doesn't communicate. That means that in moments of trial and suffering, there's an urgency for you to find how you're going to become sober-minded and alert about this situation that you're facing in. That you would realize how deeply you need that. Now, this is all critical because the next thing Peter says in this instruction, the command here to be sober-minded and alert, trials and suffering require from us a clear focus about the genuine danger they can, oppose, they can pose to us. The danger here is not just the difficulty of general challenges. It's the targeted and strategic danger of a spiritual enemy to our souls. As an insider, Peter wants to be clear-minded about the challenge of spiritual warfare. So let's talk about it for a few moments, because you notice his, his warning to be watchful is coupled with this warning that we have an enemy and a deceiver that is out to prowl on our souls. So let's talk about spiritual warfare for a moment, because it's a topic that I think in our very scientific, naturalistic secular age, we don't do a good job, even as Christians, acknowledging and being aware of our spiritual enemy. First, there's the danger of not recognizing the real reality of a spiritual enemy at all. Because we lack understanding and ability to discern everything that happens spiritually around us, in our lives and in our world, we can be tempted to discount what the Bible clearly presents as a reality. Here in this passage, Peter keeps in step with what the rest of the Bible and Jesus makes clear. We have a spiritual enemy fomenting the basic problems of sin in the world. You know, the problem with our secular age is, is for all of our scientific advancement, we look across the world and we can't make sense of why there is so much evil. At times we look at situations and we can't, we can't make sense in the modern age. Like our modern problem is we're, con we're so convinced of people's basic goodness and that the world basically can be solved just by the scientific enterprise, as good as that is. We're convinced that, it, that it, that's the only dynamics at work, that we can't figure out why there would be such evil that permeates the world and our own lives. Why we are at times, and, and, and I put us in the category of the world here, that, that we are participants even in things that we couldn't believe that we would ever say or do. And we don't have a way of explaining it out because we're convinced of our goodness here. This is someone who opposes you in court. So he says this person, this enemy that opposes you in court as a deceiver. And so when he says the devil, your enemy, the devil, he's saying the, the, this enemy that opposes you in court, and then the term is diabolos, for deceiver. Your enemy, the deceiver. So that when you just right now we have an idea uh, of what sort of enemy we face. He's out to deceive us about our trial, about our suffering, and particularly about who God really is. That's how Satan or the devil, however, whatever term you want to use, is presented to us in Scripture. We only get a, real, a few indicators of his action in Scripture and much about the why and how of Satan's existence and his work and why he exists. That's all above our pay grade. Listen, this is like divine mystery. What did God do? Why did God do it? How does this all? We don't get all the answers to the questions we want in Scripture, but what we get is a warning about the enemy we really face. And so practically, we're to receive that warning. Genesis chapter 3, where he deceives Eve by lying to her about God's real intentions. There's four spots in the Old Testament where we see it highlighted. 
Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where the imagery is symbolic, but the backstory of Satan being an angel that lifted himself up in pride rather than humility and has influenced other angelic beings to join him in undermining God's purpose for humanity is presented in those two passages. And then we see interactions in the book of Job where Satan seeks to use suffering to make Job unfaithful to God and even hate God. And so all of this works into the imagery that Peter is is really warning us about here. These ideas are then built on as this spiritual enemy is described and interacted with in the Gospels and a couple of passages like this one in the New Testament. We're told that he's like a thief who's come to steal, to kill, and destroy, that he uses deceptive schemes to make evil seem good and good seem evil, and that he prowls like a lion. That is pretty much all we get, and anyone who attempts to give you much more detailed accounting of the spiritual realm is pushing beyond the, the realities of Scripture. And, and, and so we first got to recognize the reality that's there, but many times when we talk about Satan or the devil or demonic forces impacting our lives, we get hung up actually on the logistics of how Satan could influence us or what that looks like. What are the logistics? Where does he go? Is he here? How does he work in relation to me? And we get hung up on those logistics. Some people will say things like, well, if there's only one devil, he certainly can't be focused on me. Why would he do that? Which makes sense if you're trying to figure out the logistics. Or they want to talk specifically about demon possession as seen in popular portrayals. The Gospels show Jesus with a high high awareness of when satanic forces are at work, but the focus of it is never on the logistics. And in the New Testament, it's on our need for Christ's reigning power to come to our life by faith for us and for us to be watchful of the influence of a spiritual enemy and his ideas that are sown into our life and into our world. And that is the warning here. The insider knowledge Peter is giving us is about knowing the danger and the pattern of how Satan works. Here, it's that times of suffering are opportune moments for spiritual warfare. The key is to not underestimate the presence of a prowling enemy. The reason Peter uses the scripture uh, this pic- in Scripture, this picture of the prowling lion is easy to understand if you watch nature documentaries. Any nature documentary fans out there? If you watch these lion hunt videos, they're so interesting. You get this British guy named uh, David Attenborough, right? And he's, you know, he's describing it slowly and walking you through, and it's mesmerizing. And the lion is prowling, which means that, that it sort of walks while remaining hidden, which is really insightful for us. And they're looking for one thing. We're told in the rest of this passage to resist him, knowing that others have experienced similar things to us and draw near to one another where we can be reminded that God has a good and glorious promising future for us in Christ and wait for him to reveal his plans. And so we're to be alert, to be watchful, especially in times of trial and suffering. So what do you need to do right now with this passage? Do you need to remember that God uses trials as a period of shaping future appointments in his kingdom? As we take some time today to reflect on these words, ask him to give you faith and humility to wait. Do you need to heed the warning to be sober-minded and alert by sharing your burdens with others in the body and, and praying and being watchful? Take a step today to connect with someone about how your current suffering or trial has you in a dangerous place or a place where you feel vulnerable to Satan's attacks. Do you need to hear today that our spiritual enemy would want nothing more than for you to ignore God's purposes for your life and distract you with every other thing than your need for Christ? Perhaps you are currently held captive from really knowing and experiencing God because you believe he really doesn't have your best interest at heart. And that he doesn't really care. This is exactly the deception that Satan sows in people's lives. So that you don't take the first step of trusting him. Trusting Christ. As we go into the Lord's Supper, we're going to, in a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to to take the bread and the cup. And as we do that in a special way today, we want to remember that Jesus has walked the path 
that we couldn't walk in his suffering. To pay for our sins, his body was broken, his blood was shed, he humbled himself to the cross. And in doing that, he also showed us the practical way in which we endure trials and await God's timing through victory in him. And so if you, you're a Christian and you've trusted Christ, we encourage you to take the bread and the cup and to join us as we worship through remembrance today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the promise of steadfastness in trials, for the strength that you give. We ask, God, that as we, as we remember and reflect now in these moments, that you would strengthen us that you would restore us, that you would encourage us, that you would remind us of our future and hope in Christ so that we can be steadfast under trial. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.